and welcome to this episode of Let's Talk, where we zoom in on the practical implications of our session here in the Berlin Congress about treatment concepts in the posterior region and more specifically different timing concepts. How well can we do immediate placement and immediate loading? My name is Gerrit Heikamp and I'm very honored to be joined by our two expert speakers from that session on stage. Stefan van der Wegen, you're a um, professor at the University of Ghent. And next to you is Gary Finel. You are a private practitioner specialized in implant dentistry from Paris in France. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to have you here. Let's start with the basics. When dealing with implants in the posterior region, what, what is the key challenge there? Well, I think first we have to um, look at the indication. How much bone do we have? Where is the nerve located? Where is the sinus located? How much is the bone with? Do we still have a tooth there or not? I think that's, that's a starting point. Yeah. And, and depending on how that situation is, uh, uh, we can decide which kind of protocol we, we, we will go for. Yeah. But we also talk a lot in these conferences about uh, the Champions League of implant dentistry in the anterior zone, in the aesthetic zone. What is the key difference, Gary, when, when obviously it's, your work is much more visible? What else is going on when we deal with molars? Well, I, I think, of course, as we said first, we, we, we discuss the fact that most of, the, of what we see in lectures is incisor, but most of what we do in practice is molars. So, of course, it's a crucial topic and we need to address that and understand what we can do to improve even more our protocols. But I think the major difference is that one is an aesthetic area where we have to deal mainly with aesthetics and the other is a functional area where we want things to work and to work for a long time. So we have to create the conditions around these implants to be able to maintain for a long time these, these teeth in terms of um, cleaning, in terms of uh, tissue thickness and in terms of function as well prosthetically. And what is the function that brings most challenge to implants in the posterior? Is it the forces? Is it the chewing? Or are there other aspects at play? I think indeed it, it, it is uh, mainly the forces, although I think we overestimate this probably a little bit. Okay. Uh, of course, with an anterior implant, you will have force uh, on these implants as well. So, and, and even maybe more lateral uh, forces on, in the anterior. So we always cared about the low bearing capacity of the implants in the posterior, but it's not that much of a difference with the anterior, I would say. And that's also something that's reflected from all the clinical studies that we see. I'm fascinated by something I heard in your uh, sessions that, uh, as you said, Gary, it's more than 50% of our case if we work on is in the posterior, yet you also showed, I mean, zooming in on the immediate loading, but there's not a lot of scientific evidence and data. How come? Well, I think we, we, we have to see this also from a purely practice-based clinical perspective. I mean, if you talk about immediate loading, the reason is why would you do immediate loading? And of course, like in the interior, people want to have a tooth. They don't, they don't come to you for an implant, they want to have a tooth and they want to have a tooth as fast as possible if they know that the tooth is lost. So in the anterior, why would you want to have this? Because of the aesthetics. Yeah, you, want to, you want to be able to smile. But of course, in the posterior, if it's not visible, and if it's, for example, only about one missing tooth, it's not something that, that, that is in a hurry. It's not something that worries the patient. So uh, the need to do immediately loading in the posterior is less compared to the anterior. Exactly, because of the impact it might have on the patient's life. Absolutely. Yet, Gary, you talked to us all about immediate implant placement to start with yeah. at the beginning of the session. What, what is the key driver to choose immediate versus delayed? Well, in the last years, I have increased my number of cases where I do immediately because I feel that I can really bring a patient benefits. I think I'm also empowering somehow the biology by the technique that we, we, we discussed. But um, at the end, I, I believe that um, in the posterior region, immediate implant placement is really related to case selection. Exactly. And, and, and case selection... Is, is it only possible for the perfect cases, the quote-unquote easy cases? Yeah, but the, the, the question is, what is the perfect cases? Because You tell me. The, the, yeah, but it, it's related to the clinician as well and the experience of the clinician because my perfect cases six years ago was much more restricted than the range of perfect cases I could, I could today address the immediate implant placement. Because, of course... Um, the, the experience of the clinician, the, 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 
the evaluation and assessment of risk factor is much more easy when you have experience. Sometimes you, at the beginning, I was seeing some cases and you see like, okay, that, that's a case, a perfect case for immediacy. And that was not, you know, and other case that you feel are very difficult because you think the sinus is involved, but actually you have a very wide septum and you can maybe place a, a shorter implant and it work perfectly is a very easy case to address. So it's very important to spend time on digital planning, on diagnosis, and try to understand the obstacles, the challenges of the case, and identify which case is good to start, which case is good maybe for next year or for in two years when I have get more experience. And for someone watching this who might be on the early part of the learning curve, what are the key factors that, that define for you a case that is suitable for immediacy? Is it, is it bone? Is it soft tissue? What, what is the most important one? Well, bone, of course, the, the ability to get stability, the implant for, Im I'm not talking about immediate loading or immediate restoration, but for immediate placement, we don't need to have a very high insertion torque. This is not necessary, but we still need to have a decent stability of the implant. That's for sure. I would also say that we need to have um, keratinized tissue. Mm -hmm. But by experience, I also see that keratinized tissue is usually related to the presence of the teeth. So when you extract the tooth, and then you come back in a healed site three, three months later, six months later, then you may have lost a little bit of it, but when in 95% of the case that we treat, when we extract the tooth, the keratinized tissue is usually here. So for me, the main indicate, the major uh, criteria is the presence of bone to get sufficient stability at the time of implant insertion. Yeah, because that is key. Uh, Stefan, you also talked about that so, primary no. stability if we deal with immediacy. Exactly, I totally agree. So we, we need to make sure that we have primary stability. I think that's the absolute prerequisite to do immediate loading. If we can't have the implant stable, it's no use to do immediate loading. So that's absolutely your first question. Important. When you talk about immediate loading, is that with the final restoration or is it with a provisional? No, we, it, the, I know there are some studies out there who did it with the final one. And theoretically, you could do so, but there are, of course, some drawbacks from that. So I always do with the provisional. So um, it's much more easier to adapt it, like in terms of occlusion, in terms of shape. I can, uh, even at a later stage before we move on to the final ones, I can adjust the shape a little bit of my provisional. So it gives me much more possibilities um, before I go on to the final ones. So I think it's a little bit tricky to go immediately go for the final ones, because if there's something is not going as planned, there's not, lo not a lot you can change. Exactly, and then rather make small modifications on the provisional Absolutely. than on the final well, restoration. Absolutely, and, yeah. and, and prosthetically wise also to fabricate, or today we go mostly with zirconia, to fabricate zirconia crown takes uh, quite a bit of time, so it's mm. very difficult to, exactly. be, to be fast enough to produce this crown while we can easily uh, make something in, in provisional, PMMA or chair side pickup, or whatever the technique we use. I think it's much more easy to fabricate. Exactly. Well, talking about fabrication, you showed in your talk a socket seal abutment as a solution to maintain mainly the, the soft tissue, I think, eh, after yeah. extraction. In the first drawing, I had a very practical question. I saw you working with, with a spider with composite material. And I wondered, do you make that solution chair side? Is it prefabricated? How much design goes into it? So, actually, we started prefabricated. We started digital. So we were using guided surgery it was back at almost 10 years ago. We were using guided surgery to plan for the implant position. And based on the implant position, we were creating this customized healing abutment. And we started to do that. And we published the first article in that sense. And then we started other solutions digitally with chair side, CEREC system, and, and so on. But at the end, at some point, we were having good results. But it was not apl applicable for every dentist, you know, because you need to be equipped. Like 10 years ago, not everybody was doing guided surgery. Not everybody was having a milling machine in office. And we were thinking like the solution is good, but we have to find a more practical, a simpler, a faster and a cheaper way to produce it. So we started to work on, on taking some provisional abutment, like uh, um, non-engaging uh, provisional abutment, sorry, and placing some composite around it, creating prefabricated, prefabricating it outside of the patient mouth, and then adding the composite and curing it just in order to seal, to close intimately the socket. And interestingly enough, we had the, almost the same result. We did not see actually clinical difference in the outcomes from the digital solution 
to the to the tier side solution. So that's why we started a little bit more to develop and try to understand because it was just a simpler way. Of course, both both solutions are available and, and suitable, but this is the most easy and practical way to do it. Yeah. Now, obviously, in your talk, you present great results on this socket sealing abutment. I'm, I'm curious to hear from a fellow practitioner. What do you think when, when you saw that solution? Is this the golden standard moving forward or do you see any drawbacks? No, I think, I think it's a very small solution. And I think this is really the way we should go, uh, for a matter of fact. Wh why? What, what, what do you, m makes you find it so good? Well, as, as, he, as he showed during the presentation, one of the, first of all, one of the big issues that we have with immediate placement, it's nice, you can do it flapless, you can immediately place the implants, but it, you can't really close the wound. Yeah. Mm. So, and then we try to find some, some, we can put a collagen sponge, but even then we can't really fully protect the wound. So that's, that's the first reason why this is a small solution. And, and second, um, also the fact that you can nicely support the tissues that are there, because in the end, the crown that is going to be placed on this uh, implant, I mean, we want it to look like yeah. the original tooth, right? We want it to look and support the tissues just as it was. Exactly, so, so you need to maintain those tissues. Exactly, let's try to maintain those tissues I mean, as they were. If I can comment on that, you know, in the, in the aesthetic zone, we all went into this immediate loading because at the, at the origin, the goal was to give a crown to the patient. We say, okay, we extract the tooth, we need to give a crown to the patient. And at some point, we realized that not only we're giving the crown to the patient, but most importantly, or equally importantly, I would say, we're stabilizing better the tissue and we are maintaining the tissue. And at some point, I was like, okay, the immediate, the immediate strategy is so appealing, so interesting, but I was obsessed by a way to close this socket. And I said, okay, why wouldn't we do the same thing as what we do in the aesthetic zone, but taking out the risk for loading? Exactly. You know? So basically, we're shaping the tissue exactly as we shape the tissue in the aesthetic zone, where we know that we maintain better than any other technique, but without taking the risk of load. And this was how these things started, and, and <clears throat> it's coming again. Yeah. And, and, and I, believe, I believe that we achieve what we are looking at, that is main, closing the, maintaining the blood clot, stabilizing the soft tissue. Exactly. Now, without making this a uh, celebratory for the uh, for this socket sealing abutment, you saw you you showed great data, yet there was not a hundred percent success. So let me scratch on that one and a half percent. What are reasons when things go wrong? Is there is there any learnings there already? Well, Why does it fail if it fails? Well, it, it usually we had few cases. We it's less than it's around one to two percent. I saw that. And um, it is usually related to lack of uh, stability at the, at the time of implant. Of that healing abutment or of the implant? Of the implant. Of the implant. And um, pretty much like any other situation, I would say. Of course, sometimes we, we have been pushing also a little bit the limits and there are some cases which are very challenging. But in my opinion, what I always say to the patient is we're going in a direction I will extract your teeth. I will try if I can place the implant. It's not that we are going in another direction that would compromise the rest of the treatment. I will do everything I can to place it at the time of, of extraction. If I can, it's good. If I cannot or if it failed, or if it fails, we end up being in the exact same situation as the one if we already decided yeah, yeah. to wait. You say I can always fall back on the conventional. Without any compromise. Exactly. That, that's what I believe. You know what Does I mean? Does that mean that you now if you can, and we talked about the importance of case selection, of course, but any case you can, you try to go for immediate? Well, in a, I would say in a, in a, in a decent objectives, but uh, yes, I, yeah. I, I would believe it's that. It's what you aim for. And yeah, unless that's what I aim for. Yes, yeah. and you know, there are, there are many cases, especially, I would, of course, it's more challenging cases, but cases where sinus is involved, where I know that if I extract the tooth and I don't do anything at this time, not only I will have, I will end up with a, horizontal GBR, but also will end up with a sinus, li sinus lift. Mm. Um, That's something you want to put and, it, and, and, yeah. and here I can, I can combine everything in one session in three, three, three months treatment overall, you know? Yeah. So yeah. there is, in terms of patient experience and patient perception, I think there is a, a huge benefit. Exactly. Now, Stefan, you had a wonderful presentation where you showed us a lot of science. Absolutely. Looking at immediate loading. I mean, if we're placing immediate, might mm. as well load immediate, yeah. although there's risk yeah. involved. 
you confused me a bit in the end because you showed, well, from a biology perspective, from a design perspective, a lot of things are possible, yet conclusion, I would not recommend it because there's not enough data. Yeah, well, especially when you combine both protocols, when you do immediate implant placement and also you want to place an inter interim um, restoration top of the implant, um, we don't know that much what's happening. Not in terms of the implant, not in terms of the bone, not in, definitely not about the tissues around it. Um, so we definitely, uh, from a scientific uh, point of view, we should be a little bit careful. We can't really say to the audience and to the people like, yeah, this is a safe treatment modality to do so. It might work. Yes, definitely. But Same we're question not sure. to we can't you. guarantee this. Is it this. for you a preferred option? I mean, if, if all indicators love, yes, are green? absolutely, because you, you get the most benefit from the system. This is really the indication where you would benefit the most of immediate loading because you go from a situation where the patient comes in, needs to have a tooth taken out, and he walks out of the practice with a new tooth. And that is what you want actually for, for your patient. And so it's easy, it's fast, he has aesthetics back, functionality back, but the problem is we don't really know how well it works and therefore we should be a little bit cautious. Exactly. So let's uh, <coughs> finalize this talk by taking a look into the future. What is needed, for example, for fellow scientists watching? What, what kind of research or maybe even fellow clinicians? What kind of data, what kind of cases do you need yeah. in order to bring this forward? Well, I think we definitely should have long-term follow-up data on this kind of protocol. But that um, means that we need people daring and willing to start doing it. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think also those people, they have to develop a proper protocol, what you have to take care of and which implant type, for example, you have to select in certain cases, how you will um, approach those kind of, uh, this kind of treatment. So I think we need guidelines, we need clinical data in order to support this uh, treatment modality. Exactly. Gary, final question to you as well, to bring this further forward. Are you uh, contributing to the science of uh, immediate loading as well? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's the ultimate goal, definitely. I mean, as he said, mm -hmm. at the time you extract the tooth to the patient, the ultimate goal would be to be able to deliver a crown the same day. Um, I think it's promising. I think we have good um, reason to believe that it should work, but we need to be cautious and we need to have data. Uh, definitely, I think the first step would be to to use these sockets where we have a very wide, very wide septum where we can place the implant as if we were almost on a heel site. Mm -hmm. And we should probably have pretty much the same result as uh, what Stefan showed. But, um, but yeah, we need to go step by step and already we are moving quite fast and uh, evolving rapidly into this field of immediacy. And I think it's uh, great for us and for the patient. Interesting. Now, uh, in the talk that is also available in the Berlin Online Congress, there's also a lot of science on, for example, the implant design, wider, longer, what are the effects on, for example, the stress on the bone. So if you're curious to learn more about these concepts in the posterior, especially immediate placement, immediate loading, make sure you check out the full recording, which was chaired, the session was chaired by Gary Rachubar and Benedict Speech. Very interesting, I recommend it. Or otherwise, click around on another Let's Talk or another video. Gary, Stefan, thank you very much for your time and thank, thank, you, thank you very much for watching.